I'm Louise Swin. Thanks to the Wheeler Centre and the Stella Prize, here we are at an online live in conversation. Join in on social media using hashtag 2020 Stella Prize and feel free to ask questions on Twitter. We'll try to include some of them towards the end. I'd like to begin by acknowledging that I sit here on stolen land, land that was never ceded. Wherever we sit in Australia today, we sit on someone else's traditional lands. We are live streaming tonight from the traditional lands of the Kulin Nation. I pay my respects to their elders past and present and the elders of all lands this event reaches. Now, as you all know, Jess Hill is the winner of this year's Stella Prize, awarded last week. A bit of background on Jess by way of introduction. Jess is an investigative journalist who's been writing about domestic violence since 2014. Prior to this, she was a producer for ABC Radio, a Middle East correspondent for the Global Mail, and an investigative journalist for background briefing. She was listed in Foreign Policy's Top 100 Women to Follow on Twitter, and her reporting on domestic violence has won two Walkley Awards, an Amnesty International Award, and three Our Watch Awards. Jess, welcome, and thanks for being available for this unique, somewhat reimagined online event. Thanks so much, Lou. It's great to be here. Well, here Jess, and here, here. Here, there and here, <laughs> yes. Yeah. Um, Jess, I thought that we, we would first address the situation that we're all in because of, obviously we're sitting in these, in these various different places. Um, everyone has their own specific worries during this global pandemic that we're in. But I wonder with your background, what, what worries do you have now that we've got school closures and more and more people, families, children at home? What, what, can, what have been the things that you've been most worried about? I guess so... Firstly, when, when all of those announcements started being made, I and many other people who, you know, focus on this issue noticed the obvious problems, um, which was that, you know, that women and children especially who are experiencing abuse won't have any safe places necessarily to go. Or, and more to the point, they won't get any time to themselves um, because instead of, you know, perhaps their abusers you know, going to work or or being out of the house for times of the day, that's no longer, um, that's, that, that no longer happens. Um, so my concern is that because we've seen, so we've seen different sort of t statistical changes. Um, we've seen a 40% increase in calls to frontline services. We've seen a 30% or so drop to calls to the sort of helplines where women might call for either counselling or for crisis accommodation. Um, we've seen a 70% drop in New South Wales to calls to the Child Protection Helpline. Um, so that's telling us all sorts of different things. Um, and what I feel like is that there's, there's one organisation, Women's Safety New South Wales, which in this state is doing a lot of work trying to get a sense of what is actually going on in a, in a state that we're, where there's a lot of things happening in a subterranean way that we can't actually get a hold on. Um, so I feel like they've been really good at sort of getting a sense of what's going on, but I think that we're probably not really going to know for, for weeks or months what's been happening. And my, my sense is that we hang a lot of stock on, like we put a lot of stock into statistics you know, increases or decreases in calls or emergency, you know, um, call outs. But actually what we know is that in, in cases of coercive control, for example, what we're looking at is the experience. And it's not necessarily that there will be more incidents or less incidents, but just imagine being locked in a house or being at least stuck in a house most of the day with someone who is intent on using any opportunity to degrade or humiliate you, or threaten you, or make you afraid. That's what people who are in coercive controlling households are experiencing right now. And there'll be all sorts of things going on. Some abusers will be quite placated by the fact that actually now they are able to exercise a type of full control um, because their partners and children are stuck inside the house. Others will be feeling like this brewing tension. Others will be feeling humiliated by the loss of a job and perhaps taking that out on their partners or their children. I mean, there's everything going on under the sun right now in households mm. across Australia. Um, but I think that what we're sort of looking at now is how do we get creative around letting women and children know that 
either help is available or that they can reach out to a neighbour if they need emergency help um, and they're unable to contact police for whatever reason. Um, mm. So things like bystander stuff. So that that's the that's the sort of stuff that people are looking at now. And I guess starting to get, I guess, more inventive about how to respond in these times. Yeah, I've seen quite a lot of things on social media where people are posting saying, you know, let me know if you need your nails done. I'll know that that's mm. a code for. Well, what what role does social media play in sort of helping or not? Well, I think that it's difficult. I can't really say. I'm not sort of, I don't consider myself an expert in, in especially in what's happening in these times because mm. I'm only just, I'm observing like anyone else mm-hmm. is. Um, but I think that certainly anything that is likely to get through to someone where it's going to have visibility um, but not necessarily show up as a web search for domestic violence if that person is being tracked online mm. or feels like they're being surveilled, that's that's a good thing. You know, um, I think I mentioned a couple of times um, recently that in France the government started this new initiative where women could present at pharmacies with a code word and mm. that code word would then signal a police response. Um, mm. So it's like finding out where are people going right now. Social media, obviously, a lot. Um, mm. Pharmacies for people who will have that in proximity. Um, in, in the UK, they've changed up the, um, the uh, emergency response, their 999 service, which is that if you call and if you don't say anything, the operator will say, well, if you can cough or make some noise, then we'll know that you need help. If you can't do that, it will go through to an automated response, which will ask them to dial 55. Mm. Um, and that will then pass through to a police response line. So there's all sorts of different things like sort of necessity is the mother of invention. And actually these are services and approaches that we've always needed to a certain extent for people mm. who didn't feel like they could say that they needed help, you know, in their home if they, if they felt they couldn't reach out. So actually everything we come up with now will also be useful to us after this is over. Yes. Um, and it's interesting that you sort of say that you're not the expert. I mean, of course, now you are the expert in, in all of our eyes on all of this kind of stuff. But I'm interested in where it, where it came from. Where did you first start thinking about the pre-thinking before you even got to this book? What, what, what would you say the absolute start looking back of this book was? Well, the absolute start of it was when um, Nick Fike, the editor of The Monthly, called me and said, I would like you to write a long essay on domestic violence for the monthly and mm. um, and we're going to give you 4,500 words. And back then, this was at the end of 2014, mm. and back then um, 4,500 words on domestic violence was just an outrageous, like, amount. You know, mm. it was it was not... I had not seen, at least, that type of length given to this subject. Um, this was right at the time that the Victorian government had announced the Royal Commission, um, and obviously in Melbourne, where the monthly is based, that was, you know, it was a much bigger issue in Victoria than it was almost anywhere else in the country. And I'm mm. Sydney-based. I knew that it was a, a really important issue. But at that time, I actually, I didn't have any interest in domestic abuse at, at all. Um, mm. In fact, my my interest at that time was reporting on climate change, resources, um, all, all that sort of thing. So this was like I, I, I sort of think to myself, and Nick could correct me, but that I had written this really complicated sort of essay on electricity prices and made it kind of palatable to readers, and I feel like that might be why he asked me to write about a, a similarly complex area and thought maybe I can make sense of it. Um, but apart from that, there was nothing else that really qualified me for that. Um, it was just Nick's belief in me as a writer and as as someone who could sort of bring that power of analysis to bear. Um, and it's weird because from there, that's like five years ago plus, and I feel like it's like become my calling. Mm. But it was and so, so at, what, at what point did it sort of, what point did you realise that this was turning into something much bigger, something that you were going to have to have to draw out to book length? Uh, I think that was probably when I started investigating the family law system. 
And so I went from that real personal. So the first couple of um, pieces that I did on domestic abuse was firstly on just a, a you know, what I what is now quite a brief overview in that four and a half thousand word article about the whole phenomenon of it. Um, then I went to what's going on from the perpetrator's side um, for Radio National. And then and then I I got a call from someone from from a mother, what she called a protective mother, um, telling me about what had happened to her children through the family law courts and that she'd had custody taken away because she presented allegations of abuse. And at first I just thought, oh, yeah, maybe this is such a next area, you know, maybe this is just sort of like the mother's version of father's rights groups. Everyone feels ripped off in the family law courts. And then I I looked at her court documents. I interviewed her and her parents and um, I was just absolutely floored by what was going on in that system. And I think it was then that I think it when, because everyone talks about this being behind closed doors and a private issue, and I think when I realised what it is in our public system, that's when I got probably truly obsessed with it and also a feeling of urgency that, that this needs to be exposed. Nobody else, this is the thing, nobody else was writing about the family law system, you know. Um, it was like a total taboo area and when I started writing about it, People were like, are you mad? You know, there's literally a law that says if you identify parties to a case, there's jail time or heavy fines, you know. So there's so much sort of, um, there's so much secrecy around it. And people basically, it's sort of a similar issue to suicide in the minds of reporters. It's like it's a too vexed, leave it alone. Um, it's just it's just too difficult to report on, too many mm. um, problems. And so... I think that's when I really realised, oh, my God, there is such a big project here. Um, and it, But it wasn't really until the beginning of 2016, at a time when I'd been reporting on the family law system for about six months, I was done. I was so done with the whole thing. I was mm. so, I felt really vicariously traumatised. Um, I, I just wanted to run away um, to a forest and, you know, be like, Running with a spoon in um in wild and um and and I uh and then I got the call from Aviva Tuffield at Black Ink and she actually approached me. It's how I remember it is that she approached me to write this book and every sort of cell in my body was saying no, um mm. but my brain was saying you have to say yes because because maybe no other publisher will ask someone to write this book for another ten years. Mm. So four years ago, you were already kind of vicariously traumatized, and then you, and then you had to write the book. How <laughs> did you? How did you? How did you get through all of that? Um. Well, with enormous family support, right? To starters, um, yeah. Enormous support from my partner David, who was editing like every word that I wrote, and you know, it mm. was an amazing intellectual sounding board. He's a psychotherapist, so that helped um and uh so that was that was a big part of it my my parents and David's mm. parents once we had a baby halfway through the writing process um actually made it possible for me to continue writing um at, at least you know in a few hour snatches um mm. every day but emotionally I didn't do great um I I remember the I thought I would do the family law chapter first to get it out of the way, thinking then I'll just have the hardest chapter out of the way. For me, that's the hardest to write about. Mm. Um, and I think it was a really bad idea because it sort of set me off on this whole mission, kind of already feeling knee deep in the worst of it. Um, and I think it really, it made it very hard for me to be able to gain perspective again. Um, mm. So Every, I guess the thing that kept me going was family, the fact that it was totally fascinating, like mm. the fact that it was obsessively fascinating um, and really getting across the world's expertise on this, um, both from survivors and from experts, mm. was just so, um, was a really gripping process. And every day I'd learn something new or I'd read another paper or talk to someone where I'd just be like, Oh my god, my mind is blown. You know, that's yeah. that that is a that's a real drug like that yeah. keeps you going. Um 
I also, I never wrote at home. I just thought to myself, like anyone who's writing a book at home right now, God, I feel for you because I would just get out every single day. Mm. Usually I don't have a home office really. So I'd go out to a cafe. I totally outstay my welcome, go out to libraries. I'd literally sit on street corners. Like I remember Mm. sitting up at Macquarie Street and just sitting on the foot of a statue and just riding there because I'd just be looking at the cars going past and constantly trying to remind myself of who I was riding for. Mm. It's like there's a, there are all these people. They're just going about their daily lives. Like how do you write for these people in a way that pulls them out of that daily life experience but pulls them into this world in a way that's not going to totally freak them out, mm. you know, that's going to be compelling as it is for me, confronting but ultimately rewarding and mm. enriching. You know, well, so... one of the things that you do so well is you you come at it from a perspective of somebody who who already has prejudices like we all do and has these things that they've thought for a long time and you don't just tuck them away and pretend you don't have them. You address them full on and I think that that's actually at the heart of the success of this book and it, a lot of it has to do with your use of language and the importance of the right kind of language and you get at that right from the start. You talk, I think it's very interesting, about the difference between the words domestic abuse and domestic violence. Do you want to tell us a little bit about how you came at that? Yeah, and interestingly, I mean, that was like one of the very last things that mm. happened, right? And um, mm. I I was actually, I was walking my daughter Stevie down the street in a pram. Um, this mm. was like just around the time, maybe the lunar cartoon about mothers on their phones came oh. out a little while after this, but anyway, I was, I was really, because I, I was obsessively trying to make sure that, in the weeks before we went to print that I hadn't missed something, that I wasn't Mm. being naive about something. I was just scanning everything, you know. And this article came up in Women's Agenda that was written by Yasmin Khan, who's the head of EPS Community Services in Brisbane. And she deals a lot with women from the subcontinent. And the article is basically talking about the fact that she has so many women coming to her who would describe the most horrific kinds of control and degradation, um, but then say, um, but it's not abuse because he never hit me. And the Mm. most that they would describe was having a cup of tea thrown in their face or, you know, things they didn't think were that serious. And Yasmin, who then went overseas to the UK um, to do some studies, she she found out that overseas in the UK they call it domestic abuse for the very reason that they don't want to leave women out who haven't experienced that kind of intense physical violence Mm. but who have experienced some of the worst and most dangerous forms of domestic abuse, which is, you know, namely coercive control. which is a kind of abuse in which physical violence can be rare or minor or even barely present um, or not present at all. And so when I read that article, I'm walking down the street and I'm just looking at it going, she's right, she's right, mm. damn it. Mm. <laughs> um, and because the terms in, in when you're writing about domestic violence, the language is very important and the terms mm. are always up for grabs, right? And people, you know, I'd spent a few years talking to people about how domestic violence isn't even a an adequate term because it doesn't express how severe it is. It sounds mm. so banal. Um, mm. And then I'm like, so what, I'm going to change it to domestic abuse? Well, that sounds even more benign, you know. Mm. Um, but I thought, you know, I'm always asked, how are you going to deal with the fact, and certainly by survivors, how are you going to deal with the fact that physical violence isn't necessarily the worst part? And I could never give them a satisfactory answer. And when I was walking down the street looking at this article, I'm like, that's the answer. And mm. so I called Black Ink and I talked to my editor, Kirsty, and I'm like, we've got to change the entire book. Um, <laughs> go, like, find and replace all instances of domestic violence, you know, change the cover. We had to do the whole thing. And it was, um, yeah, only a couple of weeks before going to print. And I was not a writer who had been on time. So everything was very rushed. Um So they were really gracious in sort of, you know, um, entertaining my wild notions and how important it was. And it's interesting, it's actually been, I haven't regretted it for a second, Mm, mm. um, and it's actually been one of the things that stuck out most to people. Mm. So I'm really glad we made the change. It's so much broader. It makes Mm. so much more sense to to the general reader, I think, too. Mm. Um, Do you think there's something peculiar or particular to Australian society that allows the conditions that you're, that you illustrate to thrive? Um, I think that these conditions are pretty universal. Mm. However, 
I think they thrive in, in different ways and they are they have different cultural expressions. Um, mm-hmm. I think in Australia, you know, we have we have a lot of intergenerational trauma here, um, primarily obviously in our own indigenous population, but also in in all basically most citizens of Australia, especially a migrant population, there's a lot of traumatized people, people who migrated from the from Greece after the Civil War, Lebanon after the Civil War, Vietnam, etc. And and a you know white European population who arrived here under pretty adverse circumstances, then proceeded to do pretty well for themselves. Mm. But where there's a there's been a culture of ongoing traumatization um, through child abuse, institutional child abuse, family child abuse, war, etc. I mean the 20th century was a hothouse for all of that. Mm. Um, I think and and we've never had, especially in European tradition, a good way of dealing with trauma, you know, mm. and we're only just getting to the point where we're starting to really um, treat it and and call it for the serious issue that it is. Um, so there's that, I think the unacknowledged trauma, even though trauma is not necessarily the background of every perpetrator, like it, it's a fairly, like it's a pretty common denominator. Mm. Um, and so that sort of thing in Australia particularly we're quite immature about mm. um, as a nation. But, um, and I think that what's particular about this this country is our very unacknowledged sort of um, history of um, of domination and cruelty and you know, what's been acknowledged as a type of, as a cultural genocide um, mm. towards Indigenous peoples. So all of those factors are feeding into the type of domestic abuse that we have, but mm. this is not obviously an issue that is um, is just seen in Australia and, um, and it's certainly, I was surprised, especially as I'm looking to publish in other countries, just how universally applicable a lot of these stories are. Um, yeah. I, you know, so many, I mean, the stories are written about Australians in this book, but they're just as applicable to someone in America as to someone in Russia or Hungary or Hong Kong. I mean, all these places the book is being picked up in um, mm. and with certain cultural differences around the intervention of family and stuff like that, it's basically the same story. Yeah, right. I mean, I felt like I hadn't read a book like this at all which you know it, it's not that it's not that often when you read a book that you you feel as though you've never read a book just like that before um what were some of the obstacles that got in the way of of writing and publishing this this book gee um i probably the obstacles that got in the way um, my baby, no, she didn't get in the way. She actually made the writing better. Um, <laughs> so she was she was great. She she stopped me from agonising over every paragraph because I no longer had time to do that. Um, I guess the obstacles that got in the way it was usually me. You know, it was my um, my prejudices, my preconceptions. What was you know, I went through a pretty long period of having to deal with my own rage mm. <laughs> about all of this, mm. um, especially when it became apparent that I was going to spend a lot of time focusing on perpetrators in the book, um, just like three chapters out of 10, I think mm. 10 or 11. Mm. Um, it was going to be one to begin with. And yeah, right. when I started really looking into it and really going, how are we going to actually address this as though these men have complex inner worlds and they're not just foot soldiers of the patriarchy. Mm. Um, and when I started having very long debates, arguments, conversations with my partner mm. about, about how this book needed to talk to men, that's um, I had to get through a lot of resistance because, frankly, like when I first started, I just wanted to line up all the perpetrators and push them off a cliff. Do you know what I mean? Like, I just felt angry. Yeah. I felt nameless anger. I didn't want to understand them. Um, I, I totally understand people's resistance to wanting to understand. Mm. Um, but it was this line from uh, James Gilligan, who's a clinical psychiatrist who works in prisons in North America. He um, He's done a lot of work on, on shame being a real motivating force for violence. Mm. And he said, you know, to simply condemn violence is as effective as condemning heart disease. 
you know, mm. it doesn't actually get us to understanding how to fix mm. it. And when I read that, it was like it felt like permission because mm. it's like this is not in, in, trying to, in trying to comprehend these men and, and women in, in one chapter as well um, why they do this. It's, it's not an excuse. It's, mm. it's trying to grapple with what's going on so that we can reassess what our solutions are and make sure they're actually effective and not actually doing the opposite, you know, not mm. just provoking or not just sort of dismissing the individual backgrounds of, of these perpetrators. Um, so those were, and, you know, the other another big obstacle for me was I wrote the Indigenous chapter, Da Didi, last. Um, mm. I, for a while, felt like, are stuck in between these two con- conflicting truths, one which was you cannot write a book about domestic abuse in Australia and not focus on the experience of First Nations people. Mm. And the other truth was you're a white woman um, and you don't have the time to go out and really spend time in community like you should, so mm. you have no right to write about mm. um, violence in First Nations communities. Yep. And what eventually ended up winning out was that I thought, well, I'm not going to try to write supplant the perspective of first nations women or men um so instead i'm going to try and platform the people who have really you know um alerted me to what's Mm. going on and and the and the broader issues around colonization um and i'm also going to talk about what we european settlers did to the indigenous people in this country Mm. without again without excusing the actions of modern day um, Indigenous men who perpetrate violence, but by basically just giving a sense of really looking at the taboo issue of sexual violence and the way that was used through colonisation, mm-hmm. um, and also looking at the fact that you know why pe- while people might say, oh, you know, well, domestic violence is just cultural for Aboriginal people, you know, this just mm. it's, that's the culture they came from. To go, well, let's step it back a bit and let's look at well, what was actually cultural from what we understand, and what was cultural for British people. Um, mm. And going back into the sort of 18th, 17th, 18th century um, into Britain and going, well, when we look at family violence now and we look at family violence as it was in Britain, gee, it looks exactly the same. Mm. <laughs> and it's like, gee, what, whose culture is it really? Mm. Um, and so I guess my, in, in my way of fixing that was to go, I'm going to write from a European you know, a European heritage perspective and take um, ownership of that and be accountable for it and also to talk um, in part in that chapter about the role of white women um, Mm. and the oppressive role that white women played in colonisation. So I think that instead of feeling shame and guilt and all those things that would stop you from writing about that, just did it in a different way. And Mm. I just feel now that chapter I actually, for the American edition, which is coming out later this year, they were sort of like, oh, our readers aren't going to want to read about Aboriginal Australia. You know, it's not relevant. Yeah, right. And I was like, no, no, you have to. You have mm. to read about it's crucial. these it's totally crucial, mm. these cultures. You have to you have to understand what these cultures had before we arrived. Mm. And so I actually spent about six weeks or more doing a comparative study between between colonization of North America and the colonization of Australia wow. and the experience of First Nations women in um, in North America um, and the similarities um, because I just did not want to lose that chapter. So it's become for me, uh, for me, it's the cornerstone of the book. It actually shows us mm. what is what is possible um, in in how we can relate um, interpersonally because I actually think that Indigenous cultures in Australia, mm. North America, and elsewhere. Um, I were had incredible expertise in interpersonal relating and um and things that we could learn from and really we have if only if only we could find the evidence for it in a in a in a more in a broader way than what we have we could have the dark emu of interpersonal relationships mm. you know come mm. from indigenous Australia um mm. and I think anthropologists like W E H Stanner Phyllis Cabry a whole bunch of others and modern writers like Judy Atkinson have really sort of borne that out. Mm. so is that going to be integrated in the american edition those yes wow fantastic yeah Yeah. i agree i think that's crucial and i think that all of your agonizing has contributed to the book being a better being a better book thanks and you know 
That's the thing also is that, you know, um, people talk about like Twitter being a hell pit of, you know, <laughs> awfulness. Um, and, 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 but it's funny, you know, I've been on Twitter for a long time. I've been mm. on there for over apparently 11 years, I was told the other day. And, um, and I, I would always run in my mind what I was writing past the most astute people that I would see commenting every day. And yeah, just go, right. what would they think about that? Who's going to pull me up on that? How how vulnerable am I and why am I vulnerable? You know, so I felt yeah. like I always had the audience in my head, partly because I was naughty and was still on Twitter while I was writing. Um, and, and um, But that audience really kept me honest as well and just That's kept great. me going back over it and going, be better, do better, yeah. really reinterrogate that. You're not onto it. You're, there's too much of you in there that's not that's not been analysed enough. And, you know, that's why I kept on blowing past all my deadlines. So I'm sorry <laughs> to my publishers, but that's what I was doing. <laughs> A good news story about Twitter. That's always, that's yeah. always good. <laughs> I'm interested in the policing that comes through in the book. Um, in the book you mentioned in Argentina, they introduced a, a women-only police station. first one was in 1985. How do we get women-only police stations in Australia? And can you tell us a little about how those how those work? Because there were other places that had women-only have women-only police stations too, aren't there? Yeah, yeah. So this um the research that I use in the book comes from Professor Kerry Carrington, who's done mm. a lot of um she's done a lot of field work in Argentina specifically. And um in terms of how we're going to get it up, I think you know Kerry will play a large role if we ever do get. Um, these police stations trials here in Australia, she's certainly coming back with the research to show that they're effective, um, mm-hmm. as you say, in multiple countries. And what they basically are is in um, in Argentina, Brazil, countries in Latin America, they're used particularly, um, you know, they're fascist dictatorships that fell in the 80s. Um, when they fell, it was quite clear that the police were not going to be the people that women came to for help because those mm. police were the same that had like literally handmaid's tale like mm. you know impregnated women stolen their babies mm-hmm. disappeared women disappeared children you know so um so there needed to be something different there was the understanding that the misogyny not just misogyny but a, a but a history of trauma was there so these police stations for women were essentially they, what's very important to begin with is that they are not answerable to the Minister for Police. So they are in a totally different re- line of reporting. Mm. And what they do is they, they have um, brightly painted um, houses, often in barrios or neighbourhoods, or they have shop fronts or, or whatever. They're not cells. So they're not mm. like the grey foreboding sort of police stations we have here where you walk in and you're in a place of law, you know. Mm. this is These are welcoming places. They are brightly painted. They've got um, comfy furniture, paintings on the wall. Most importantly, though, when a woman comes in to tell her story um, or to report what's happening, there are childcare workers there, there are financial counsellors, legal counsellors, case workers. It's a full service. Mm. And when she comes in, when she's reporting to the police, who have all the usual powers of police, of investigation, of arrest, that she's not um, mandated to go ahead, press charges, go ahead with an intervention order, go to court. She gets to sort of call the um, the shots a bit on what happens. So she can say to police, I just want you to go around and talk to him so there's visibility. Or I just want you to go around and remove him from the house. Or I really want to press charges. But there's a, there's a degree of power um, and a degree of flexibility on behalf of the police, which is mm. not the same here, mm. um, so that when women walk in there, they're not losing their power because the thing that happens to women in, in so many relationships is that they are they are managing a situation um, and, and to them, if another person comes in and doesn't understand the very particular balance they have in place, then that's a very dangerous situation mm. because... A lot of women feel like if the police do the wrong thing, um, then they will either poke the bear or give the bear the impression that they will not be held accountable and things mm. will get worse either way. Um, so these police stations, I guess, they encourage women to report early because there is that flexible response. And mm. what they found is that actually the reduction in homicide for particularly 
for young people is um, is is quite astonishing. Um, there was even, I think, in the cities, I, I, I can't quite remember the stats off by the top of my head, but in urban areas, um, there was a 50% or so reduction in, in homicide, I think, for a particular age group mm. and like an 18% reduction for across the board. But, you know, th- those I'm not exactly sure about the stats. Overall, what's important to know is that there was a reduction in homicide and that when they were surveyed, people said that they felt like they would feel more comfortable reporting to these stations and that they were actually helping. Mm. Um, And I think in Australia, you know, as Kerry Carrington pointed out to me, it's like 80 to 85% of sworn officers are men. And a lot of those men are going above and beyond their their station when it comes to helping um, victims. Mm. Absolutely. They're handing out their personal mobile numbers. They're going out, you know, when they're off duty and making sure that everything's okay. So there are amazing police officers doing amazing jobs. And then there are other police officers who are handing over personal details to perpetrators, you know. Mm. And and the problem is, is that victims don't know who they'll get. Mm. It's not that there aren't good police officers. It's just that when there's both going on at the same time, you don't know who you'll get. It's total postcode, not even just a postcode lottery, it's a station lottery. Mm. The person on the front desk may be rubbish, but just behind the desk there'll be someone who's excellent. Yeah. So that, and I guess what I'd really like police to look at is that they're doing so many amazing changes in various states, particularly Victoria, but there's not, if we're to really change the reporting rate from 20% of victims currently experiencing violence to something a lot higher, then we need a radical reform, not just sort of incremental improvements and not mm-hmm. a generational culture change within police, which may or may not work. We need something that is just like totally changes up the situation mm-hmm. if we're really serious about it. And, I mean, it should probably come from a policy direction as well. What, do you, what kind mm-hmm. of government changes would you like to see? Oh, my God. Um, where do you start? So many. Yeah, yeah, it's a bit of where do you start. Definitely yeah. um, the family law system. Um, mm. I the, the policy change, well, first and foremost, just cancel the review because it's oh. just it's ridiculous. Mm. And it's from what I've heard, the first public hearings, um, you know, the people that were being called to give evidence are manipulating evidence. You know, mm. they're manipulating data. They're, um, they're anti-feminist fathers' rights groups who are really dangerous, um, which is not to mention the fact that Pauline Hanson is co-chairing the review. Um, mm. But so what I would like to see on that front is I want to see children put back at the centre of family law and the safety of children. You know, at the moment, if you've got an intervention order, even an intervention order that names the children as needing protection from that person, a family law order will override the intervention order. Mm. You know, um, there's just, there's so much emphasis put on the rights of the parents to have contact with the children and therefore much less emphasis put on the rights of children Mm. to not have contact with a parent they're afraid of. Mm. So the first place that I would go for major structural reform and cultural change on so many mm. levels it would take us an hour to talk about would be the mm. family law system. Mm. Um, I personally am an advocate for criminalising coercive control. I know there are different um, opinions on that from within the sector and, and from academics in Australia. Lots of concern about would it be used to further sort of um, focus on Indigenous Australians as often mm. new laws are, you know, disproportionately focused on on marginalised communities so there would be, need to be a lot of work going to protecting them from from that kind of outcome mm. but for me criminalising coercive control is a cultural change on par with criminalising marital rape mm. um, and I think that it's it's fair to say that probably the vast majority of marital rape cases are not prosecuted mm. but that's probably not the most important part of having criminalised it it was about sending a message to society that it is possible to rape someone in marriage, that they do not just give consent on their on their wedding day. Um, and what flows from that culturally is different depictions in film, in music, in, you know, law really does change the way that we perceive behaviour mm. and it changes the way that we talk about it, changes the way that we create on it. And what I've seen happen in the UK 
is not only do we see better reporting on coercive control, which we've only really started to see reporting on very recently here in Australia, actually using that term, but we also see um, radio dramas focusing on it. Mm. Um, you know, so many creative approaches to depicting coercive control mm. where and that level of education um, in that society is just invaluable. So mm. I think that if, like in Scotland, you had a coalition of women's groups um, and, and anybody who's dealing with, with um, victims of coercive control, together with the bureaucrats and the policymakers, really drafting this legislation carefully and with enough time to do it properly, I just think you'd be able to take care of the problems um, mm. and that overall the benefits would outweigh the concerns. God, yeah. I mean, this is a question that's coming from Franca, but we actually had a lot of questions along these lines. What can we all do to help? And mm. particularly people who've not experienced it in their lives, what practical advice can you give? Um, and especially, I guess, in light of COVID-19, what can people be doing right now? Do you advise? What can people do right now? Mm. Um, I think it's really important to take an, an an active role in the lives of people maybe that you have stopped um, being close to, um, perhaps because actually they've stayed in a relationship that you disapprove of or that you feel like they just weren't listening every time mm. you told them that it's not good for them, reappear in their lives. You know, mm. make, make it clear that you are present um, in whatever way is safe to do so. I think there's, there's also been advice given that um, that you could if you if there's a situation with a neighbor and there's enough of a relationship there establish some kind of code word um, or even if you if you have exchanged numbers um, some type of messaging system where they could just message you an emoji which would signal that that they need help they need mm. you to help respond um, there's you know just generally trying to be more present in the lives of people that you feel may be isolated and in danger is a really good place to mm. start um just hang on one second Lou um I just yeah. have one um that is just me the, no the, that's that's sorry, terrific advice has just, has just totally um chewed through power and it's just given me a warning so I just thought okay. I would that's what happens um, when you're live yeah yeah so um so that's what yeah so I think that those bystander actions um are really important especially now um mm. and I think that trying to be creative I guess it's it's all about how can you how can you be present in the lives of people who are under threat um, and who might find it difficult to get you know to get help that's mm. that's that's the basic sort of question we need to be asking ourselves yeah absolutely that's great advice I think that we can all take something from that um I'm interested in I guess it's been less than a week now, but I'm interested in what winning the Stella Prize with this book means means to you. Wow. Um, it's meant a gigantic amount to me. Um, mm. I uh, It was weird because, you know, I was told so many weeks before it was actually announced. So yeah. by the time that it was announced, I, I felt like it had been so much a part of my life already, you know. Um, yeah. But... I think what it means to me, especially with this book, is that, you know, this book is now going to be in bookstores. Um, it's, you know, the, the first couple of months was interesting. There was a real, there was a real difference between um, bookstores that really backed it and ordered heaps of copies and then bookstores where it just wasn't present at all. Mm. And, um, and I felt like, fair enough, I understand that people probably weren't sure whether it would actually sell. Um, mm. But so now I guess it, it it makes sure that the book is available, you know, for um, ongoing. For, and then, you know, in terms of actually the people that I've written about, you know, I really meant that in the in the speech when I said, like, that I really wanted victim survivors to feel in their bones that their stories matter and that, you know, the world really is listening to these stories now. Mm. And that this prize is just further validation, you know, that, it's no longer the fact that that stories about these types of sort of unglamorous subjects don't win prizes, you know. Because uh, mm. to be honest, like for the first little while I was like, you know, I feel like this book because it has been shortlisted for a number of awards and I felt like 
maybe, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe we're not at the time where this book can actually win an award. Maybe it's always just going to be sort of the, the runner-up because it feels mm. like oh, you just don't give an award to a book like this. But mm. well, I think what the Stella did was just really reiterate, no, that this is the time. Like this is the mm. time when books like this need to be really foregrounded. Um, and then personally and professionally, it's weird because it's happened in this sort of strange vacuum where you don't see anyone. <laughs> yeah. But I've just had hundreds of messages, just everybody I've ever known, including the mum of a guy I used to have a crush on um, in primary school, um, contacted me. <laughs> and, and you know, they just, everybody knows about it. It's quite bizarre, you know, as a prize. Yeah. It's just, it's astonishing. Um, Do you so, hear from lots of readers? Do you get lots of feedback from readers in general about your book? Oh, so much. Like right. so much that it's almost impossible to respond to. Um, right. And those letters are just so heartfelt and they're so, um, you know, people will just tell me their entire story and it's not necessarily just victim survivors. Um, it's also, I mean, it's also been perpetrators as well. Mm. Um, but it's also um, just people who have read it who don't even necessarily have any experience with it but just feel like it's opened them up to this whole new world that they're not sorry to have discovered. That's mm. what's really gorgeous about it, you know. Um, in fact, um, one um, one former Stella Prize winning author, Claire Wright, she, she contacted me the other day and she said that her um, son's girlfriend, who's early 20s, had picked up the book and had been like, I'm not sure if I'm ready to mm. know all of this yet. Mm. And, and Claire said something like to be... Um, forewarned is to be forearmed or something yeah. like that just yeah. to, you know that, that knowledge is not dangerous you mm. know and and then she picked it up and apparently she was sort of reading it all day um so I I feel mm. like this is a book that needs it needs people to pick up but I feel mm. so often I get the feedback that once they've started reading even if they've had to put it down for their own sort of mental health um you know and then pick it up again later or intersperse it with other sort of you know works of fiction um but it is something that people stick with yeah um even when they feel it's difficult and other people burn through it in like two days um which I find astonishing I'm like how dare you read it so quickly it took me so long to write <laughs> but um but the the feedback honestly you know both by email um by mail by you know in the signing line at writers festivals Mm. I've just had the most gorgeous interactions with people. It's been um, truly transcendent. I think one of the things that that really draws people in first off is that is the title. Was that? Did mm. you always know it was going to be called that? God no, no. I um actually so in my working draft um it was called the story of us, and that was to remind myself that this is a book about all of us and that I'm writing it. Mm. I'm writing it with that in mind. Um. As but, opposed to the bad guys. Exactly. And yes. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Not us and them, not yeah. otherizing. I'm not writing about a cohort that I don't have any relationship with. Yeah, it's, yeah. Uh, yeah. Um and and then I went to my um Facebook friends um <laughs> for advice, you know, uh, towards the end because I just could not for the life of me figure out a name for this book. Everything yeah. that came to mind felt awful. And um and so, and just some of the suggestions from from very intelligent people were terrible um and um <laughs> and so we ran this sort of thread and the thread itself was just I wish we had some way of documenting it yeah. um, of people going back and forth people weighing in with their own life histories and then um this woman Nikki Stevens who's a documentary editor um she just one line said look what you made me do Mm. and everyone just immediately responded it was like whoa that absolutely and people were saying that's exactly what he used to say to me or that's mm. what my mother used to say to me or that's mm. what but you know so many people just were to so switched on by that and chilled but also intrigued and then someone said well look what you made me do isn't that a Taylor Swift song and I went I don't know is it <laughs> And uh, and so and so then we sort of went through and and actually um, one of the people in the book sent me this thing about she's quite litigious with people who use her song titles. So then we were like, oh man, you know this perfect title, bloody Taylor Swift has taken it, and um, and we're not going to be able to use it. And 
And then um, Black Ink, they were very tenacious with it and they they, they came back to me and said, look, no, none of the other alternatives are, are doing it like that one is, mm. so let's just change it to see what you made me do. And I was like, oh, that's pretty straightforward. Good thinking. That's why they pay you the big bucks. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> um, you have said that the increased attention on men's violence may be making perpetrators more dangerous. I'm interested in that, particularly in the time that we're in right now. Can you talk us through that a little bit? Yeah, sure. So in the book I talk about um, one interaction I had with the then head of Safe Steps, the helpline in Victoria, Anna mm. Gillespie, who said that they had people calling in saying, can you please get them to take the ad off TV because every mm. time he sees it he goes nuts. Mm. Um, and the sense that when it's made visible um, and when there's a sort of, you know, calling for accountability, um, that that can be quite provocative, especially mm. if there's, um, you know, there's there's a lot of people who are abusive or who use abuse who have who who have no clue what they're actually doing, um, mm. and or, or are not conscious of what they're doing. I should mm. say they may be, you know, conscious of certain choices and whatever. But mm. that's a great, that's a longer conversation. But people who are actually sort of pretty conscious of what they're doing when they see it sort of represented on television can get very angry. Um, mm. And certainly I saw that come through in some of the stories um, as well where um, particularly bad attacks would happen after, say, um, the Q&A special on domestic abuse. Um, mm. So so this sort of backlash is very difficult because it's not that you don't want to be doing awareness, right? You don't. It's mm. not that you want to take that campaign off the, off the television, but mm. it does make you think about, okay, how do we, it's a very difficult public health mission how do we actually talk about domestic abuse make and talk to victims but also talk to perpetrators at the same time mm, mm. you know in the sense that being aware of how perpetrators are hearing this and how provocative it may be do we just say who cares mm. um they're not the audience and that's not who we're going for or do we try for something more sophisticated um mm. i think right now you know I talk a lot in the book about humiliated fury and about mm. um, about deep seated feelings of, of shame um, and, and a type of toxic shame that can then um, erupt into violence and control. Mm. Mm. And you know we're in a time now that's so difficult. There's so much. There's so there's so many opportunities for people to feel humiliated right now mm. if that's if they if they identify very strongly through their professions mm. or through their KPIs you know all mm. that sort of thing mm. so that's I think that you know I've said before I, and I, look I don't know from a research perspective this is just my hunch but that I think that the the um the, the social service measures that have gone into keeping people being paid not not everyone but a lot of mm. people being paid um has probably offset a lot of potential domestic abuse you know mm. um because there's there's less humiliation on a nationwide mm. scale um and but there's still a lot of people who are being who are falling through that crack and mm. even people who are being subsidized you know um people who are used to getting a type of validation um, through their professional life or who are also used to having a type of release you know i think about um about let's use one example um there was a guy that I met, for example, who was still on an intervention order. Mm -hmm. um, he was, he'd been, he, the intervention order had come as a result of him throwing his wife out of bed um, one night. And he'd found out in a men's behaviour change program that he'd actually been degrading and humiliating her for years, you know. Um, and and he was like, from the sounds of things, at least from what he said, he was pretty conscious and, and it had a fair amount of self insight. But he still needed at that time, once he, if he felt sort of like something brewing in him or him getting impatient or whatever, um, or that he was about to sort of blow up, he'd need mm. to like leave the house, right? He'd need to leave the house, go to the gym. Well, mm. people like him aren't able to go to the gym anymore. They're not able to play team sport. They're not even able to go and you know, indulge in terrible vices like problem gambling or, you know, mm. anything else that where they might have gotten some sort of either release or gone to sort of put all their problems into when they felt like they were losing losing control, mm. you know. Um, so even just that um, mm. is, is very difficult right now. Um, 
So it's it's hard to know exactly how this is going to affect perpetrators this time. I think you will see some very uneven um, effects depending on, on the individual situation. But mm. one thing we definitely know is that where where there are perpetrators who are intent on maintaining control and that is their, their strategic intent, um, particularly when those relationships are over and there are family law orders in place, we're already seeing, you know, shared parenting arrangements being used mm. to further enlist control measures like, you know, um, Women's Safety New South Wales did a survey of workers and what they're, what they're hearing a lot is, you know, um, particularly fathers who will refuse to hand the children back. Um, one anecdote I heard is because when they announced that that school was being cancelled, they announced like early holidays in Victoria or where there was mm. some language. And on a family law order, holidays are very important, yeah, right? right? And yeah. so, and so, you know, there were perpetrators who were able to use that language to to justify either taking the kids or withholding the kids or refusing to have the kids. Um, there's also been quite a lot of thing around um, around shared parenting um, switchovers. So a lot of the changeover places have now closed and there's no place to be safe in that way. Um, yeah. So there's so many different ways in which this is an issue and especially where relationships are over, you know, um, mm. And because people forget that, you know, coercive control does not necessarily end when the relationship does. There are so many forums in which that can continue. Mm. Um, and, the, and the virus really gives a lot of opportunities for that to continue. Mm. I know that we're going to have to finish up soon, but I just wanted to hear what, how you felt about what feminism has got to do with this whole subject. Mm, everything mm. <laughs> it wouldn't literally would not be a subject without feminism mm. um i mean certainly we've had in the past um i mean if you look at the history of how domestic violence has been handled um through the centuries it's been an issue of law before feminism was was really a, a political issue but mm. it was much more of a public order threat it was a, it's a it was a threat to public safety um and since you know, in the last few centuries, since privacy became much more important than public order, apparently, mm. or the safety mm. of citizens, um, you know, it's it's really been feminism that has put it back on the agenda. It was the, you know, suffragettes in the early 20th century, especially Australian feminists, a lot of that feminist movement was really driven um, by the concern for violence against women. Mm. Um, but then that sort of all went quiet again. Once women got the vote and everything, mm. it was sort of like, everyone forgot mm. the political action around domestic violence. Um, and then the 70s come and and feminists bring it up again and it's like we're hearing it for the first time. Mm. Um, and But really when the, the language was invented in the 70s by feminists, but not only that, what we have feminism to thank for is also the construction and the, and the understanding of what is masculinity. Mm. What what is the role of men and the idea that actually when we talk about gender we're not just talking about women we're talking mm. about men as well and the whole project to understand men and to understand patriarchy and just to understand how patriarchy acts on men and how it and how it drives certain responses um, you know that sort of thing you know that was really the work of feminism and without mm. feminism we just would not have an understanding of domestic violence like we do now. Mm. Gosh, Jess, I feel as though you have got so much to say on this subject, which is hardly surprising given how long you've been you've been thinking about it, writing about it. Um, and I feel like we could we could talk all night. And thank you to everybody who contributed with their questions. Um, we will have to finish up there for now, though. Uh, but the conversation continues online, of course, and in our homes and hopefully in places where decisions are being made uh, and this book is being read. Thank you so much, Jess Hill, for your generosity here today and congratulations on your stellar win. Again, massive congratulations. Thank um, you, Lou. And thanks for everything that you did as well, just reading oh, and dozens and dozens of books and, <laughs> and no, being it really such was a, a pleasure. guiding light. Yeah, it really was a pleasure. And I want to thank the Stella Prize and the Wheeler Centre for making this all happen today. And thanks to all of you out there who are listening and reading 
and interested. Um, so have a good night, everybody. And thanks also to the Wilson Foundation too, who the patrons Absolutely. prize. That's yeah, you know, it's just an incredibly unique prize, and I'm just so grateful for it. Yeah, they're amazing, the Wilson Foundation. Well, thank you, everybody. Good night. Good night, Jess. Thanks, Lou.